Well, I'm Judy Markland. I'm on the planning board and I am the lucky person who gets to deliver this presentation, I guess. Um, maybe the other planning board members could introduce themselves while they're here. Sarah? I'm Sarah Cooper. I will try to get, I'm gonna manage chat and advance slides. Um, so let me know. So I will monitor that or you can raise hands and we'll, Brant will, whoever is moderating will see that. And I'm Brant Shikis, also on the planning board. Don, did I see Don? He's muted. We have some guests who've been very helpful. Well, Waitley staff people and guests. Um, Hannah Davis, who is the community development person for Waitley, who has been a huge help on this. Um, Joy Dupereau, is that right pronunciation, Joy? Perfect, perfect. And uh, she is with Department of Conservation and Resource and has given much more of her time than um, she probably should have, but that's been helpful. And Peggy Sloan, who has guided us through this process with great patience. She's with FERCOG and my cat is decided to participate, which won't help. Hi, everyone. <laughs> so um, the reason for this session is to try to explain to you this new floodplain district bylaw that the planning board has developed. Um, we would like to present it at town meeting in May. And before then, we'd like as many people as possible to understand exactly what's involved and how it affects them, if it, if it affects them. This, this document, the bylaw itself is eight and a half pages long. Um, a lot of that relates to town responsibilities, not individual responsibilities, but much of it in, in establishes some new procedures for people in town. So we hope you'll get comfortable with it. We would like feedback. Um, we have maybe less latitude to incorporate feedback than we would sometimes because a lot of this is based on state regulations or state requirements, but we always welcome suggestions and we can we have worked and we will try to work to make it clearer as we go along. Um, I read in Conway that Conway, as they go through this process, described what they were doing as tightening up their floodplain regulations. And I think that's a good description. That's basically what's going on here. Um, you all know about the increased flood risk from climate change. Um, our area is wetter. The storms are much more severe. There's a lot more flood risk. Um, Sarah, maybe you could put the slides up. Everybody see that? There we are. I can't. No. I'm not a, seeing it either, Sarah. It just says you've started screen sharing, but it's there we go. Good. Good. Can you make it full screen? Yep. No. Um, down in the right, down on the left on the bottom. Well, that's all right. It's, it's Why don't you start the slideshow, Sarah, at yeah. the top? If you hit slideshow and then go from the beginning, then I'll get it. Go full, full screen. Uh, it's uh, right after animations. If you're going across the top, slideshow. Thank you. And then uh, from beginning, and it will be full screen for you. You can see we didn't rehearse. See if you hit from beginning, you got to click that one. While you're looking at this, this is the- Here we are. After, oops. Back one. <laughs> it's 
Okay, maybe we want to have somebody else manage this part. You can use the arrow keys on your. Thank you. To go back. And now. Here. Okay. You went way back. Yes, I went all the way back because I am also still letting people in. So well, maybe, maybe Brent. I think it may be better if somebody else does share, then I can do the chat. Yeah. All right, you're going to have to make me co-host. I've already allowed, you're allowed. Okay. All right, let me just, um, picking up on, maybe Judy, you might, while I'm getting this ready, let people know about questions in chat and that sort of yes, thing. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm working off an iPad, so I have enlisted no help. Audio. Grant Maybe. is going to field questions or let us know when there are questions. Uh, Sarah's going to monitor the chat. We welcome input both ways. Good. Now, everybody should be able to see it. Good? Good. Thank you. Thank you, Brent photo is of Deerfield after Hurricane Irene and all of the photos here will be after Hurricane Irene. That's Mill Village Road. So I think the second slide, Grant. How we got here, um, we started with a template from DCR. Um, Peggy Sloan and Furcock worked with us extensively to adapt it for Waitley. We've had it reviewed by town council and by the DCR. And we are here now talking to you. There will be a public hearing also with more chance for feedback and input and education. And then we propose to take it to town meeting for a vote on May 24th. We hope by then that we will have convinced you that this is a great thing for Waitley, but mostly we hope by then you'll understand it and be comfortable with it. Brent? Next, yeah. Now what's it supposed to do? Why is it being proposed? Well, I think the most important thing is to help ensure that property in flood risk areas is being protected. We want to make sure that people are aware that they're in a flood risk district and to ensure that they're not endangering their property or other people's. We also want to reduce the potential for both pollution and environmental damage. Um, it's important to see that hazardous materials aren't stored or they're exposed to flood risk. We want to see that changes are not made to the landscape that increase the potential for erosion, floods, and more damage. And I think the last part, and not necessarily the least, is to ensure that Waitley property owners can continue to participate in the federal flood insurance program. Passage of something like this is required for eligibility in that program. I should have said, if anybody has questions as we're going along, please raise your hand, yelp, some, do something to let us know. Um, yeah. yeah. I'll leave them. Next slide. What this does, it creates or establishes an overlay zoning district that's defined by the floodplain insurance rate maps, 1% floodplain elevations. Um, this is an overlay district, that means it it literally rides over the existing, other existing zoning districts. And unlike the aquifer overlay district, 
its boundaries will perhaps will change over time as this firm what they call the firm rate maps changes. Yes, but in 276, some states have temporarily pulled back on their state gas tax to give consumers relief. Ryan, okay. could you please mute yourself? Thank you. The, um, the current map was drawn in 1979. And as long as I can remember, uh, people have been saying oh, it's going to be updated in the next couple of years. Well, it hasn't happened yet, but it's it's long enough now that I suspect it probably will. But when the, until then, this is what we have. When we get a new map, then the districts will change, and we'll we'll let you all know. Um, the critical thing from from property owners' perspective is that this this new bylaw creates new review map requirements for what the bylaw describes as development activities. This is development is a defined term in the bylaw. Um, it has specific meaning that I'll get into later, but um, there are new procedures for new activities. And that's the gist of what I have to tell you today. So get to that. The third thing, important thing, is that the bylaw requires the appointment of a floodplain administrator. Um, this person will be Hannah in, in our town or the community development position, has a lot of reporting duties to the state and to other people, especially the state, I think, um, and is also involved in the review process. So you will, if, if you are in the floodplain, if you initiate a development activity, you will get to meet the floodplain administrator. Grant, next slide. The current flood risk map looks like this with the dark blue areas. Um, you, not surprising, they're by and large, they're all related to major waterways in town. If you're looking for your own parcel, you can get better, more detailed information at the Waitley Assessor's Maps. There, um, thanks to Don Sluter and his work on the layers option in those Assessor's Maps, there's a flood flood layer, flood map layer that will let you see, um, at least in informational terms, how the district works on your parcel to give you an idea of whether you're in the district or not, or whether the activity you are planning, I guess more importantly, is in the district or not. I think the next slide. The development activities, we, we talked about this defined term of development development in the bylaw. And these are the ones with, that would require review. Um, this is not the wording in the bylaw. This is sort of a general overview interpretation that I made, but it's basically a change to, to the land or change to the real estate. Um, putting something on top of it, being a structure or new storage of equipment or materials, or changing the shape or contour of the land by dredging or grading or paving or mining. If you look at this, some of this has implications for things that you don't normally think about as needing review. Um, one of the quote structures that is included in the definition is in, as development is fence fencing, um, storage of equipment, um, paving. So, so these activities, which reasonably I think one could worry about in a flood district aren't ones that 
typically fall in, in zoning bylaws. So it's one thing we wanted to get across here is that you have to be aware of these changes and aware of what might re require review that you hadn't thought about before. You know, are there questions? Because this really is the gist of, or a, a very key part of what's involved here. We're also quiet. Uh, Judy, I have some questions. Okay. Um, I have questions about, about hoop houses, uh, you know, an unheated plastic covered greenhouse that's not generally considered a permanent structure. Um, do you want me to list them all or go one by one? Well, I don't know. I can't answer those. I mean, the okay. particulars, um, I think we tried to, and I don't, I don't know if Scott or Joy could, we tried to develop a list in advance of things that might specifically be required or not. And I think we came down with the idea that it's hard. These things are so individualistic and the circumstances vary. I mean, I can, I can't, I think maybe Scott or Joy could answer better than I, but I would think with a, something like a hoop house, it might depend a lot on how deep you have to put the frame to and how much disturbance you're doing to the ground. Man. Joy says it, she can help with this. Oh, good. Yeah. It, is that all right? Please. That's why you we love that. Okay. So a hoop house, as you described, Margaret, is an agricultural um, amenity or feature, if you will, a structure. Uh, and so typically a, a regular sized hoop house, and I say regular meaning not something that's the size of an amphitheater, but the size that you usually see on a farm or out in an agricultural field, um, typically, those are what we call de minimis. They're not actually uh, a structure of any um, uh, substance enough to uh, impede the floodplain. I mean, most hoop houses that I've seen, if there's a flood coming, the hoop house will probably be destroyed. Uh, is that your, yeah. So what this um, development activities is really concerned about is anything that will change the floodplain. And that can mean several things. That can mean something that will increase the base flood elevation simply by the fact that the thing, whatever it is, building or whatever, takes up so much room in the floodway, in the floodplain that now the, the uh, storage of floodwaters has to expand or get higher. So um, a hoop house probably wouldn't do that. Also, um, the other thing is anything that would um, adversely impact your neighbors. So if someone were to put up a, a solid privacy fence, for example, across maybe a perennial stream or an intermittent stream. And then all of a sudden there's a flood and that stream is used to carry some of the floodwaters. Um, the fence may divert the floodwaters to the neighbors and erode their property or something like that. So that really, this definition as Judy points out is very broad. And as she points out, um, many communities don't always think of all these things, but typically all of these things come under either the building department or the conservation commission, or they are things that the state actually takes care of, like a large mining operation or drilling operation, your community really wouldn't be um, focused on that. The state would have regulations that cover that. So I don't know if you want to present another item or not, or if, if what I've described might help you to to categorize these things? Yeah, that is that is very helpful, Joy. I guess I'm I'm then interested in understanding what the process is. You know, if you're if somebody is going to put up a hoop house, and I would say they vary in size a fair amount, if you know, even just driving around Waitley, but you're right that some of them are are not enormous and I think wouldn't um, you know impact where floodwaters went. Um, but I am curious about whether the landowner can make the decision, like I'm putting up a reasonably sized hoop house and I think it's de minimis or whether they need to go through the process and get, you know, the check, the check boxes checked that Hannah and the CONCOM, you know, agree with that assessment. Yes, that's entirely a local decision that your community will make how that's handled. 
Okay, so then I'm throwing it back to the local community. Can you, can, I mean, and I can throw in some other examples. You know, if somebody wants to put a load of gravel, you know, filling in ruts on their farm road um, is, you know, or do a small amount of grading. Um, if, you know, Judy, you mentioned fencing. That's something that I think, as you said, has not been something people have had to get permission for before. And I'm, I'm also curious about, short-term storage of equipment you know if you're if you leave something in the field overnight does that count if you leave it there for a month or two in the summer does that count um you know where's where are the lines and when do you need to check with the town yeah, I, this is brant if i could just jump in here um and have judy and joy confirm this um and i'm gonna move the slides just back to this slide where the, the bluish purplish are the, um, the, the flood zones, that the bylaw does not apply generally to all parcels in Waitley. Just wanna make sure that's very clear, yep. right? Yes. It's really only applicable to property owners of parcels that fall within these demarcated flood risk zones like along the Connecticut River and you know and here in Central Waitley and so forth. So I just wanted to allay concerns if there were any or misunderstanding that development of all of all kinds taking place anywhere in Waitley is now suddenly subjected to new floodplain related um, oversight. That is not true. Okay. That's also yeah. not true on the parcel where it's outside the floodplain district. Yes, that doesn't. Um, of course, Margaret still has great, you know, very legitimate questions. Just wanted to make sure that it's understood that they it, it relates to parcels inside the district. Thanks, Brent. That's helpful. Good. I have a couple uh, chat items, and then we have someone with their hand up. Um, the chat item was, one of them is, if updating septic systems are an issue, Waitley should look at building a wastewater treatment plant and sewer system. So I, that's one thing. And that was from M. Zykowski. And the next question was from Joyce Palmer Fortune. What does the review consist of? I will get like to that. Me too. Okay. And Mr. Jackson. Yeah, I just, um, the question I have is, this is a bylaw we're talking about, right? It's, yes. Would there the be regulations bylaw. promulgated after the bylaw is passed? They can be. The planning board doesn't normally do, do regulations. Right. I mean, so, we have, but. Yeah, I mean, if this were a wetlands bylaw, <clears throat> you would pass the bylaw and then the Conservation Commission would promulgate regulations that would answer some of the questions perhaps that Margaret has. So it might say that, you know, hoop houses are allowed provided they meet these conditions, in which case they only would have to apply or, or file or, or get reviewed if they can't meet those conditions. So that might be one way to address these concerns where, you know, whether it's somebody's private driveway or an access road for farming and somebody wants to fill in the, the ruts you know, that could potentially be addressed by regulation rather than have to, you know, figure it all out with the bylaw. Well, well, it's my understanding that the process, the review process here, when we get to it, throws most of this back to the Conservation Commission anyway. So um, we can work with you to develop those. Yeah, but the thing is, is that Conservation Commission doesn't have jurisdiction. We only review and advise. It's the floodplain I manager think this, that administrated this it. Well, okay. I mean, based on the last, last iteration that I read, you know, we don't issue permits. We don't give permission to proceed. We just review and, 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 uh, and report back to the administrator. Uh, so that it's a little murky for me how the process is going to work. But if it's going to be the Conservation Commission that has to make those calls, then I definitely would want to see regulations so that every time somebody wants to, 
you know, repave their driveway, they don't have to come and talk to me uh, about whether they need to file or not. You know, and I assume we're going to need forms. We're going to need processes for filing uh, and describing the work that would be reviewed. Um, so anyway, I, would, I don't really know. I have one other question I want to put out there that I, I've asked before, but I haven't gotten an answer to. And uh, Peggy, I think you said you were going to look into it. But I'm still unclear whether uh, towns can pass bylaws uh, that are stricter um, than the state law when it comes to regulating <laughs> agriculture. There's the letter from the Attorney General's office in, in regards to the town of Medway's um, or Med, uh, yeah, Medway's wetlands bylaw that basically says that no local bylaw can be more strict than the state law. Has that been resolved? Has that been looked into? I think that uh, particular question went to town council. Um, but I don't have that handy. So let me look back. Judy, do you recall? I recall a not very specific answer to that. Um, yeah. Hannah, do you remember? No, I don't have it off the top of my head, but that's certainly something that we can touch base I on. I do know. I, I looked up uh, the agricultural exemption uh, 40A section three, and there's a sentence in there that I interpreted as a carve out from, from, from the agricultural exemption that says no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall exempt land or structures from floodplain or wetlands regulations established pursuant to the general laws. This is in the, in 40A3, the ag section. So it, it looked to me just as though um, agriculture is subject to DEP laws that they would be subject to this, but. Yeah, the, the one place where it would be of question is generally the way that the regulations are written under the Wetlands Protection Act that determine whether the Conservation Commission has any jurisdiction to review is there can be no substantial fill in floodplains, but there's also a place in the regulations that says that buildings are allowed and that there can be no substantial fill or loss of flood storage capacity apart from the footprint of the building. And so essentially somebody could propose buildings and we wouldn't have any jurisdiction to review the extent to which the building reduces the flood storage capacity of the floodplain. But if they wanted to build up land around the building, then we would have jurisdiction over that, but not the building itself. Otherwise, I think we would have jurisdiction over any kind of fill or loss of flood storage capacity in the floodplain. It looks like Joy might. Yeah, sorry. Um, can I just make a couple of observations? <clears throat> so these regulations that you're speaking about for your bylaw are considered minimum national flood insurance program regulations. They are minimum. Uh, and uh, we have 341 NFIP communities in Massachusetts. Every one of them are required to pass these minimum regulations. Um, these minimum regulations do not interfere with the Wetlands Protection Act. They do not interfere with any other state laws. They have been approved by the Attorney General. Uh, they are, you know, they are completely for flood, the floodplain, the 1% chance FEMA defined floodplain. So I know you showed a topo map earlier with some purplish colors along the streams and rivers and so forth. If those lines line up with the FEMA floodplain, then that's your floodplain. Um, so I have not come across, I've only been doing this in Massachusetts for six years. I did it for a number of years in another state, the same job. I have not come across a community in Massachusetts yet that has found that these regulations conflict with anything that they're doing. Um, with regard, Mr. Jackson, to your one statement about um, putting a structure in the floodplain and not having to worry about compensatory storage, that, that's not actually the way it works. Anything 
that's put in the floodplain that occupies space in that floodplain that the current flood storage capacity fills in the 1% chance flood uh, is required to have compensatory storage, a building or anything. So even a building is definitely required in the floodplain, not outside the floodplain, but in the 1% chance, the 100 year floodplain, if you put a building in there, you are required to have compensatory storage. That's how the conservation commissions are supposed to implement the Wetlands Protection Act. Um, and most of the communities I work with do it that way. Um, you know, it's, it's not true under the Wetlands Protection Act, and I can give you the citation if you want. But you would says, be the only community that reads it that way, which is fine. That's between but it, but you that's and what DEP. The, it's what the straight English of it yeah. is. Very few communities actually read the, the regulations. <laughs> I do it for my work. I do yeah. workshops on the exemption. Well, uh, so people may not know it's there. It may not act upon it, but I'm just concerned because of the Medway letter. It sounds like what you're saying is that the, the federal requirement preempts these sort of state exemptions no, and no. that the Med, Medway letter of 1996 would not suggest that that would interfere in any way. What I'm saying, I don't know anything about agricultural exemptions. What I know is that these um, requirements that are in your bylaw, now compensatory storage is not a minimum NFIP standard. That's a Massachusetts state law above and beyond the NFIP. But in your bylaw that you're looking at tonight, these are minimum NFIP regulations that you have to adopt at the local level to remain in the NFIP program and they do not conflict with other state laws in Massachusetts. These minimum bylaws do not. I have a question. Uh, is the Hurley Heath Park included in this floodplain district? And the second one is why aren't these bodies of water along Interstate 91 included? All right, well, that's sort of the awkward silence. So, um, <laughs> yeah. did everybody hear so, my comment? I, I, Fred, I, think, I think you got to go look at the map, Fred. Yeah, yeah, this little yeah. map isn't going to help you. You got to go on get on waitly.org. Get right, the assessor's but, map, hit, put the floodplain on it, and go look in detail at the places that you're curious about. Right, yeah. the, the ones along and, 91, and I can see on here, they're not colored. Well, I assume they're not colored unless the, they're a lighter blue or a lighter purple. There's nothing along the bodies of water on I-91. Well, Fred, we can't answer why the the map is the drawn. The, I mean, obviously, they don't meet the definition of one percent flood well, risk. Not have flood water coming pouring down from Vermont in them. I mean, I can. I'm not an expert on this at all, but I could speculate for some reasons why they might not be impacted the way, you know, certainly the Connecticut or even some of our smaller rivers might be. Mm -hmm. And these are 1979 maps. So in reality, there may be flooding in other areas of the community, but for the purposes of the bylaw, the only areas that are regulated are the FEMA 1% chance or 100 year floodplain, according to the FEMA map. This is not a FEMA map. Someone may have very carefully laid the FEMA floodplain on this map. And I'm not arguing this map. I'm just saying the only official map for the purposes of the National Flood Insurance Program is the FEMA map. And your map is unfortunately very, very old, um, but you are in the middle Connecticut Huckate watershed and FEMA is working on that now. The work maps are expected to come out this summer. So people in your community will be welcome to review those work maps at that point. I don't expect a lot of changes because there's not a lot of money for them to make detailed studies in every town, but those work maps will come out this summer and then those will be followed by some preliminary maps with an appeal period. So the anticipation is that sometime within the next year, year and a half, you um, will be asked to adopt this bylaw um, if you don't do it before that uh, in order to be able to adopt the new maps that come out in 2023 or 2024. So um, 
uh, you know, your map is old and you're right, Mr. Orlovsky, there may be many areas in your community that you think are in the floodplain that aren't shown on the map that way. And that might be just because the mapping analysis they did in 1979 is inadequate in many ways. Well, if it's going to be part of the bylaw, I, I think the map should be current map. This is the current map. Well, it's a, I hear it's you're saying it's this 1979 map, but whatever. Okay. And we have a couple. The, the maps in the assessor's uh, file uh, are are more current. Should be the current ones. Well, I this think the, the, the current point is this is as current as we are, Fred. Right. Yeah. Okay. It, the the mapping of the boundary of the floodplain is done by another age, an agency outside of Waitley. And that mapping to determine the boundaries of the floodplain was last done in 1979. It's not done on an annual basis. It's done very occasionally. And there's new mapping going on now, but it's not complete and it's not available. So the only data we have to go on now that marks the outer limits of the 1% flood risk area is based on 1979 data. And that's what is depicted on what you're seeing here in that purple area, that 1979 based area. Well, all these along the 90, Interstate 91 were there in 79. They may be because they were spring fed, Fred. They're yeah. spring fed, Fred. Okay. Yes, they're they're yeah. self-contained. They're not they're not yeah. flowing by. So they're not as affected. There's a couple more questions in chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one is: Does this only apply to the portion of a lot that is in the overlay? Yes. And the other question is: Can we talk about what review consists of? Yes. Um, let's move on to slides. All right. Get us back on track here. This is the next slide after the. Yeah, uh, um, I think we've discussed the agricultural activities and discovered that we need to go back to town council. Um, I read the what I thought was the carve out from in the agricultural exemption. I think it's quite likely that these are included, but we'll we'll get more in specific on that. Um, the other, I think, is that there are for for mobile structures, there are requirements here, siting requirements. And so RVs need to either be road ready and or or not to be in place very long. And then Grant, the next slide, I think, is the And I'll the I'll take you right there, but Joyce did add a question and which picks up or connects to what Fred was bringing up. So Joyce asked. Uh, did anyone say why we'd want to adopt this bylaw, given the fact that our overlay district is based on, you know, let's ar arguably out of date data, set 1979 data? And I think Joy can answer that. I mean, my own understanding of the answer to that question is that if we do not pass this bylaw, then uh, Waitley property owners. Who, who own parcels in the overlay district would uh, risk not being eligible for the federal flood insurance program. That's the main, the, the main need for the bylaw. But maybe I'll defer to Joy for a, a more thorough answer to this question. That's 90% that's of it, Mr. Chekis. Um, the, um, if you don't have a compliant bylaw, then the then FEMA will essentially throw you out of the program, which means that the policyholders that you have will not be able to renew when their policies come due. Also, it means that if there's a federally declared disaster, certain disaster assistance will be withheld from communities that do not participate in the NFIP, and you will not be able to get certain um, flood risk reduction mitigation grants from the federal government because you don't participate in the NFIP. There's quite a few ways that they penalize communities that are not in the NFIP. Uh, and in order to be in the NFIP, one of the requirements is that you have compliant bylaws, which this one is very wonderfully compliant. 
very good. And when the, um, the, the mapping data is updated, perhaps in the coming year or so, then in effect, the bylaw is now, will now be with reference to the, new, the newly defined boundaries of the, the flood district. So it's yes. not like we're going to have to revise the bylaw each time the mapping data is changed. Right. The only thing that has to change each time the mapping, uh, each time you have a new effective map, you would just have to kind of readopt the bylaw by just changing the date reference to the maps so that everybody knows which maps you're following. You're not following the 1979 ones anymore. You would be following the 2023 maps or whatever. Okay. I know there's some other things popping up in the chat, but I'll just move to the next slide and we will not over. Oh, well, I saw one of them and it's easily answered. Joyce asked whether anybody in town does have federal floodplain insurance. And the answer is yes. There are several policyholders in town with quite large uh, amounts insured. This is the, the basic process. And I what I did was try to compare it to, to the existing zoning, um, which is on the right. Um, now you would normally go for a building permit. You go to the building inspector. You might need wetlands review from the CONCOM. You might need a special permit from the ZBA or variance. And if it's not a single family home, you probably need site plan review from the planning board. All of those still would apply in the floodplain overlay district, but this other development activity that we normally don't think about as needing review is stuck in there. You need approval from the CONCOM and then, or a review by the CONCOM to see that you're compliant. And then the process would be that you get these approvals and then you go see the floodplain administrator and get a sign off that yes, indeed, um, you are compliant, you can go ahead. And I don't know if that answers the questions people had about the review process. Well, maybe if I go to the next slide, it might sure. be clearer. And there, we will get to a question about septic systems, but I think that's, I think we, maybe we'll, we'll get through the material and then we can address all of the questions that are coming up. Um, how does, what does the property owner do? Well, first you go to the assessor's office and look at that paper map because the other ones that are available are informational only. You get those necessary approvals and then you trot down and see Hannah or whoever is then the floodplain administrator and get the sign off. And, uh, and that's basically it. And it's, and there is a penalty um, if you were found non-compliant. So. so perhaps as a thought experiment, one of, uh, you know, one of our fellow citizens points out that uh, you know, many houses have, um, many houses in the floodplain have septic systems that will periodically need to be replaced or repaired or things like that. So that's potentially some, that would be an example of development. So, um, are there in the floodplain? Uh, well, so the the claim here is made that all houses on the east side of River Road from the from from Christian Lane North, um, their backyards are in the floodplains, and most septic systems are in the backyards. So I don't know that this is. So it's, it's suggested that we may have a number of houses uh, that have septic systems lying within the floodplain. But those are um, Board of Health regulations under DEP. So surely uh, those are what you've been following all along anyway. Um, yeah. yeah. So this would, so Joy, would the, um, you know, the repair of an existing septic system or um, if a new house were built um, with a new septic system, how would that relate to this, this particular bylaw? Assuming the parcel uh, lay within the uh, floodplain overlay district. 
Right. So if the um, Board of Health approves the location for the new or altered septic system, in other words, the soil percolation, the DEP regulations, everything is met that way, then the only floodplain uh, regulations are that it would be um, installed and constructed so that no floodwaters can enter that system and no pollution from the system can come out into floodwaters. So if it's a closed septic system, that's fine. If it's a leaching field or that kind of a situation, you know, I don't know how that wouldn't get into floodwaters. I don't know how um, that would work anyway, uh, considering if it's in the floodplain, I don't know where the groundwater table is, but uh, that's again, a board of health um, decision as to the okay. location of septic tank systems. So in terms of what we're seeing, if a resident in town needed to do work of whatever kind on a septic system, um, and that it went in a parcel that fell within the floodplain overlay district, then as what we're the slide that we're looking at here would say, well, they need to obtain the necessary approvals to do that work. And going back to this particular slide. Um, there would be Board of Health as well as potentially Conservation Commission review. Is that right? Definitely Board of Health, at least for the siting of the system. You know, because there's, again, I'm getting a little outside of my wheelhouse. The yeah. Board of Health, the DEP has the regulations on water pollution and septic tanks, septic systems. That's a DEP regulation um, that is implemented by a local Board of Health. Uh, again, all I know from the floodplain perspective is that what's in the septic system can't come out during a flood and the floodwaters can't go into the septic system. That's the part of the minimum regulations under the NFIP. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's a place where we don't overlap probably as much as we should. But the NFIP stays curtailed to let's not put that stuff in the flood floods, you know, the floodwaters. Um, so, Joy, if it, can I just ask a question? If so, if you already had an existing um, septic system and the groundwater table was increasing, so they maybe needed to make a raised system, that raised system presumably would be subject to this review because it is impacting the flood storage. Is that correct? Under the Wetlands Protection Act, yes. But how about under this floodplain bylaw? Uh, as long as the raised, you know, the fill that's put there does not increase the base flood elevation. Um, so let me, I don't want to take a lot of time, but there is a higher standard in Massachusetts that's found in the Wetlands Protection Act. The minimum standards under the NFIP say that if you're in the flood way, you cannot raise the base flood elevation at all in any way by doing anything. If you're in the floodplain, which is the broader floodplain outside of the floodway, in the floodplain, you cannot raise the base flood elevation by more than a foot anywhere in the entire area, upstream and downstream. But in Massachusetts, the regulation found in the Wetlands Protection Act says you can't do that anyway because you have to provide compensatory storage. Um, and I know uh, one of the gentlemen earlier brought up something about the footprint of the building, and he subsequently let me know that's in the agricultural section of the Wetlands Protection Act. So I'm not familiar with that, but I do know um, that in general, in Massachusetts, you can't put anything in the floodplain if it's going to increase the base flood elevation. That's either by minimum NFIP or state law. Does that answer that, Peggy? Yes. And just again, before we move on, again, there is another related question about, you know, if, if a parcel partly falls within the floodplain district and, and some part of it falls outside. So if, for example, somebody uh, puts a fence um, in a parcel, but in the portion that's not in the floodplain overlay district, then they don't have to worry about these additional steps. And we've Correct. Or you confirm that that's true. Yeah. The only um, note I would make about that is if you place a structure like a building on a lot and any portion of the structure, even like a little corner of the structure is in the floodplain, then the entire structure has to meet the floodplain requirements, flood resistant standard constructions in the building code. 
but a fence that goes that's outside of the floodplain is not our business. <laughs> okay. So Judy, I'm back to these photos. Well, that was just the end um, questions, and I think people have have been asking um, and should keep on going. Judy, I have a question if I could interject here. This is Mike sure. Becca. I have a question of if you have part of the floodplain within your parcel, how do you put that on the ground to know where it is? Are there any controls within any of the? Yes, that's the work of a land surveyor. That's what they do. They go to the site and they use their maps and their instruments to tell you where that line is on your property. Sometimes an architect or an engineer can do it also. It has to be a registered design professional um, that can tell you that. Now, so if it's really, um, sometimes that's very clear on a map, but your maps are really difficult to use. I hate to say that you probably already know that. They're so old and you have many more streets and different things um, than your old maps show. Um, certainly many things have been done in Waitley since 1979. Um, so that's what makes it so difficult for you because in many communities where the maps are not so old, the maps are actually digital and they're on the FEMA in the FEMA National Flood Hazard data layer and they are really very clear and you know a property owner can get a pretty gosh darn good idea of where that line is on their property but for Waitley and all of the communities in Western Mass unfortunately uh, we're not there yet when you do get your new maps they will be digital um, and so you'll have a much better, uh, they also will have a photo underlay or for photo ortho base, I guess is what they call it. So you'll be able to see like a 2021 or 2022 Google map underneath your flood maps, and you'll be able to have a much better idea where that line is. Uh, but for technical and official purposes, it would be like a land surveyor or an engineer that would put that line on a site map for you. As far as the Conservation Commission, I mean, if a property owner comes before them with one of, you know, one of those things that's called development, uh, the Conservation Commission can make that decision based on their understanding of the map. So I'm not saying that everybody has to have a land surveyor. I'm just saying that if you really want to know exactly where that line is on your property, that's the only way. So I think. Um, another question came up with this proposal, are the flood zone boundaries changing or staying the same? And I think the interpretation of that is, um, have we made any changes? We, uh, we used to have a flood hazard overlay district. Is that right, Judy? Yes, it's the same district, basically. It's the same district. I don't see Scott, other questions. I have a question for Scott, if um, if he's still here. I heard. I think you said that that the CONCOM would establish regulations after the bylaw is passed. So, so if the planning board was to establish regulations for this, that would be after the bylaw, not before. Is that correct? Correct. You know, you pass the bylaw and once you have the law, then you write regulations to implement the law. And yeah. it sounds to me like this is sufficiently complex that it should have regulations. But yes, I think the so. Question of whose regulations, if it's your bylaw, they should be your regulations. Um, if you want the commission to review and comment on any proposal, we that I mean, I, that can be done, but it's hard to imagine how the CONCOM would be implementing your bylaw, but I'm, I'm not sure. I think, well, it's a small town. We ought to be able to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> so there's another question really about what's the, um, you know, what's the key map here? So the online assessor's map, as we've mentioned is, is just um, advisory. 
the authoritative map is the paper map that's maintained in uh, town offices. Is that accurate, Judy? That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. That's right. The paper maps are available for viewing at the town clerk's office. So um, as soon as you go into the town offices, you can talk to Amy Schrader and she'll be able to pull them for you. They are also available online. Um, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm used to using them. I know for someone new looking at them online, they'd probably be like, oh my God, where am I on these maps? But I'm very happy. You know, if you have a property owner who wants to know something about the map uh, as it relates to their property. Again, I can't provide an exact floodplain line, but I could have a pretty robust discussion with that property owner to try to give them the piece of the map that shows their property along with uh, Massachusetts has a GIS system. They've just recently renamed it Mass Mapper and the Mass Mapper shows parcel boundaries and building footprints. Um, again, it's not the official floodplain map, but they do overlay the Q3 data as best they can. So if you take the parcel map and the building uh, footprint shadow that's in Mass Mapper and you apply it to uh, the regular FEMA map, you get a pretty good idea of, of what's going on there. And again, I'm very happy to help somebody. You can give, a, um, you can give one of your citizens uh, my email address or my phone number and um, I'll get right back to them and help them figure it out. Don, how different is, is the assessor's map from layer from from what Joy just described on Mass Mapper. Still, I'm still out there. He's there, he's but done. he's muted. He's there, but he's muted. Judy, the, the assessor's map, it does have the state's GIS on it. Uh, every year, the state updates their GIS mapping and, and there's, uh, eight to 12 years of GIS data on there. And there are overlays for floodplain districts, uh, wetlands and, uh, well, of course, the GIS uh, on the assessor's map. Well, the that's, assessor's that's... map is, is updated uh, every year. We pay to have it updated. The state has a contract to update, make it current every year. So it, most of the data is, is, is very relevant and up to date. I just am not sure. I think what they're saying is that the floodplain map is not up to date. That the overlay that well, on the is part of it. map is, is but, well, it's certainly not up to date and it's also not the official FEMA map. It's somebody doing their best to put it in there for us, but it's not the map you have to comply with, that's not getting updated I, for you. This is Don, Don is, or Peggy can answer this better than I, so. Um. At the end of the day, my understanding is that the paper map that's at the town clerk's office is the official map that one needs to comply with. But the digital maps that are currently available are the you know best approximation of that paper map but at the end of the day, the official map is the paper map. Correct, Joy? Yes, yes. E even the mass mapper map um, is considered to be an approximation. Uh, the only thing that's official, actually official, is the FEMA map itself in whatever format, whether it's your paper map in your town clerk's office or the one that you clip from online from the FEMA website. Uh, but certainly those other maps are very critical in helping people understand where all of that is taking place. It's just that for purposes of insurance or purposes of building code uh, regulations, you have to use the, the FEMA map. So I'm not seeing any new questions in the I chat. Have one I have one final, less a question than a comment. It's I, it's very helpful to me to have um, worked out this understanding that there will be some regulations promulgated once this has passed, because I, I really appreciate your efforts to you know come to the AGCOM and to have these hearings so that people can ask questions. But I feel like the, 
you know, the most specific questions um, that help people understand what's like, you know, what's the process going to be for a particular activity and what's the likely outcome, um, you know, there really aren't specific answers to yet. And, and so I think being able to say to people, we actually don't have the specific answers to those questions, but you can come to the planning board and tell them what you think when we write the regulations, you know, maybe the best answer that's possible at this stage. And at least then people understand what the process is because, you know, the questions that I've heard, particularly from farmers, you know, around roads and fencing and hoop houses and those kinds of things, you know, it, it isn't very clear when, you know, once this is actually in place, when will somebody be able to, to look at the guidelines and understand what they can do and when won't they? So, mm -hmm. um, it will, you know, that I can see that there's a process in front of us and I think it's yeah. good to make that clear to people. I think we all learned a lot today. Yeah, I just, Joy, if I could just ask in other, are there other towns that have adopted these bylaws so far? Yes, yes. Um, so, so every community that's in the NFIP across the country has to have compliant bylaws. One issue in Massachusetts is that uh, when I came about six years ago, I looked at the bylaws that were in most of these towns and I asked uh, my colleague who'd been here for 33 years doing this job, I said, why are the bylaws not compliant? And he said, what do you mean? And I pointed out a number of things uh, and he said, well, that's just the way we do it in Massachusetts and FEMA approved it. So apparently there were FEMA staff at some time in the past who approved bylaws in Massachusetts. Uh, then FEMA staff changed about the same time that I came here and they looked at the bylaws and said they're not compliant. And so we all knew you can't just suspend 341 communities at once. So we've been working since about 2017 on getting the minimum NFIP standards to be in a shape called the Massachusetts Model Floodplain Bylaw, which um, FEMA approved in 2020. Uh, and that is the minimum standard. So now every community in Massachusetts that's in the NFIP will have to adopt those minimum regulations from the 2020 model. Now um, that's happening sort of mapping exercise by mapping exercise. So for example, um, in Southeastern Mass, there's a Huck 8 watershed called the Cape Cod watershed. Strangely enough, it's not on Cape Cod, but in any case, those 31 communities had to adopt the, 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 uh, this model bylaw uh, last year, just about a year ago, uh, because they got new maps and FEMA would not accept any other bylaw besides this one. So uh, they did. And now other communities across the state are adopting the model bylaw, just like you have in this one, um, community by community. The next set of mapping, uh, new maps that come in are the Charles, and there's 90 communities in the Charles watershed uh, that all have to adopt this same. So ultimately, um, although Hannah's done and Peggy a ton of work on this, you don't, FEMA and the state are not gonna make you adopt this until you get new maps. So, you know, you can adopt it now. And then when you get new maps, all you do is change the date uh, or you can wait until you get new maps, but this is what's compliant, and this is what you'll have to adopt sooner or later. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, FEMA will not be happy. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess the question I was trying to get at is, do you know if other communities have promulgated regulations to implement their bylaws, and have any other communities involved the Conservation Commission in reviewing and approving activities within floodplains under the bylaw? Yes, so I do not know your specific answer. Have they promulgated regulations? I would suspect that they would. I mean, they have to follow this bylaw. So however each community chooses to follow it, uh, the state looks at it as that's the community's, uh, that's up to the community how they do it. As far as the conservation commissions, they are heavily involved. So in most communities that do really good floodplain management, the conservation commissions work hand in hand with the building department. Because again, uh, most of the minimum NFIP regulations are actually found in the Massachusetts State Building Code and that's enforced by the building department. So your building official would be enforcing 90% of the NFIP regulations just by enforcing the State Building Code. Even if you weren't in the NFIP, uh, those would still be being enforced by virtue of state law. 
So this um, bylaw is kind of the handful of minimum regulations that just aren't in the building code. And typically, yes, conservation commissions do have a great deal of oversight into what happens in the floodplains. That's the intent of the Wetlands Protection Act in the first place. And I just tell you, Mr. Jackson, I have a whole hour and a half presentation on conservation commissions and how they implement the NFIP. I'm very happy to give it to your town anytime, you know, just, uh, just let me know and we'll yeah. pre represent that. The, the, the thing I'm most concerned about, and if the, your, what you have covers it, then I'd be, I'd be very happy to see it. I mean, I'm, I'm very familiar with the responsibilities and the jurisdiction under the Wetlands Protection Act. But where there are exempt activities, we're going to have to create new forms, new procedures, new regulations, and in particular for agriculture. Uh, and so I just wondered, are other town conservation commissions the ones that are writing and promulgating these additional regulations for what would otherwise be exempt activities under the Wetlands Protection Act? Yeah, I'm, you know, I, agriculture doesn't come up on the east side of the state, which is where most of the communities that I'm familiar mm -hmm. with have adopted. Um, and so you have a very fair question there, you know, uh, on, on your side of the state, uh, there's quite a bit of agriculture. I know that these minimum regulations don't conflict with state laws regarding agriculture. So I think if someone said to me, well, look at this in the bylaw, this conflicts with the state laws for agriculture, I would want to see that because then I would need to reckon that with FEMA as to what do we do about that. But that just has not come up at all. Yeah, and in my reading of the regs, as I, as I sent you a separate message, it's just that one section on agricultural buildings yeah. Uh, that would, because everything else is got sort of common language that says, so, you know, as long as no substantial amount of fill is placed in the floodplain, bordering land subject to flooding. So that means that most other agricultural activities would have to meet that condition anyway, or they would have to come to the commission. It's just that question about buildings that, that I just haven't heard anything that if, if you're, if you were to say that this, that the attorney general's office has stated that the model bylaw does not conflict with any other law, that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, he has the, the attorney general's office, they have not stated that. What they have done is reviewed all of the bylaws like this one that have gone into effect and they have passed them. So my the consensus is if they conflicted, they would not have been able to pass them. However, um, you know, agriculture is covered for a great part under the building code. So what I would like to do, Mr. Jackson, is um, as soon as I can, I don't know if I can get to it this week, but I would like to look into that and send you uh, information from FEMA about agricultural structures in the floodplain. Um, I know they do have some guidance on that. I'm, uh, I need to reach out to my friends in Kansas and get that. <laughs> they, they have a lot of it out there. Uh, yeah. And I'm happy to share that with you because it's a federal program. So if it's good for Kansas, Kansas it's good for Massachusetts. Yeah, yeah. that'd be great. And if, if you don't have the Medway letter, I'm happy to send you a copy of it because that's the one that gets cited over and over again when we tell commissions that their wetlands bylaws cannot regulate agriculture more strictly than the state law. Yeah, I'd love to see that letter. Yes, thank you. So Judy, I think, is there anybody else besides the floodplain, is it administrator or manager that gets appointed to administer this? As far as I know, it's just the floodplain administrator. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else besides the administrator and the conservation commission that's involved with reviewing activities that might be inconsistent with the bylaw? Oh, well, yeah, every, the building department. The building department, the, every, every um, board in town that reviews has to take the floodplain bylaw into account. Mm -hmm. Right. Does any other board in town have to change their jurisdiction in order to do that. Like the Conservation Commission will have to, because essentially what you said is we have to review everything. Well, I interpreted it to be that if the building department were reviewing building permits, that they are doing the review. Mm -hmm. It just says in addition to any building permit or other local state, uh, this may be an old one, You'll have to tell me if this is outdated. It says, in addition to any building permit or other local, state, or federal permits needed, 
it requires review and approval by the Conservation Commission for all proposed construction or other development in the floodplain overlay district. I'm, I'm sorry, what are you reading? I'm reading from the fourth draft, September 16th, 2021, uh, section G. There may be several other drafts that came after that, but I don't know. That wording is still there. Um... Yeah, can I say that's not uh, a minimum requirement. That's something the town had in place. And uh, when I work with folks like Peggy and Hannah, uh, the only time I make a comment about something in place that's already in place is if it's going to conflict with something else like the building code, then I make a comment saying this conflicts with the building code, or if it's something that might confuse people. Um, so uh, I did not comment exactly on this section G um, because I don't have a problem with it. Uh, you know, every community gets to decide how they're going to implement the NFIP regulations. So we don't try to tell communities how to implement them. We just tell them what it is they need to implement. However, they choose to do that. This was a, um, a local decision, section G. Okay. So Scott, you, you would prefer that this somehow said, um, excluded just reference circumstances for development activity that's not covered by a build a building permit. Um, well, I mean, it may be something that requires a building permit, but it also requires conservation commission approval. But that that would happen anyway under the Wetlands Protection Act. Yeah, yeah. It's really it's really the exempt stuff that the stuff that we don't normally already regulate, I worry that suddenly now we need to do it, which means we're gonna to have to create standards, we're gonna to have to create regulations, we're gonna to have to create procedures and, and forms so that, you know, somebody wants to put up a sugar house, you know, in, in, in well, sugar house is probably not the right thing, but a, a greenhouse, you know, and it's gonna be under 4,000 square feet, that would be out of our jurisdiction under the Wetlands Protection Act in a floodplain. But then with this bylaw, it's sort of saying, no, you still have to be review and approve it. So then we have to ha have a way for landowners to apply to us, you know, yeah. to either ask whether they need a full review or whether to submit all the information necessary for a full review. So if I could, we had lots of discussions about who was going to fulfill this role and because the Conservation Commission, um, and I think you were part of these discussions, Scott, reviewed so much already, aside from the exemptions, that it made sense to maybe expand their, their review purview a little further. Um, but acknowledging that, you know, there would need to be some kind of a separate application uh, perhaps with accompanying regulations so that um, there was a clear process for people to follow. Yeah, no, I remember that. And, and for us, you know, those exempt activities that may require fill or other things, it's the same thing we would do for non-exempt activities. So it's not really more difficult. It's just how will it be managed? You know, will the, right. the floodplain administrator be the one that creates the forms and the, and the procedures and then refers it to the commission for an opinion? Or does the commission actually have to formally approve on some kind of official form? Uh, the thing is, it's not our bylaw. So, you know, we could, we could, I mean, in the same way that we sign off on building permit applications by indicating that, no, we have no concerns about it. That's an easy thing to do. It's an informal uh, thing. But if, if it's formal action that we have to take, then we have to figure out how we pass, how we construct the rules and make them public and, and the process, et cetera. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's the next step is, yeah. to, is to make an application um, that can be handed out for folks for those exempt activities. Um, are you saying, Mr. Jackson, that you don't use order of conditions for things? We do for anything that's under the Wetlands Protection Act. I'm talking about anything that's exempt. And, and in, like I said, in large degree, that's agricultural stuff. Okay. A lot of agricultural stuff, 
you know, uh, they don't normally come to us, but we don't normally get requests for large amounts of fill or other things like that. Uh, it's the buildings, I guess, that are going to be the thing. You know, if somebody wants to put up a greenhouse or hoop, a high hoop or, or, or any of these other agricultural structures, you know, they may want to ask first so they don't get into trouble. And then that there's going to need to be some kind of guidance about what does need to go through the formal review process and what doesn't. Um, I see a couple of FEMA agricultural structure policies in my FEMA box. Um, so uh, if Hannah can give me your um, email address, I can send those to you and you can at least take a look at them. And Joy, would you mind copying me that, on that email? Yeah, sure. And Scott, if you could copy me on the Medway letter, just because I'm sure this issue is going to come up in other Franklin County towns that have agricultural activities. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. My, my, the email address for the Conservation Commission is just conservationcommission at waitley.org. And Joy, when you send it to me, I, then I'll have your email address and I can send you the Medway letter. Conservation Commission at waitley.org. Yep. No spaces. Okay. Perfect. No punctuation. I'll send it in the morning. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry to be a pain in the butt, but um, no, it's, mostly it's I've helpful. just been sort of like drifting along saying, okay, well, let's, when this gets finalized, I'll figure out how we're going to do this. But, you know, I'm starting to realize that this may require more work, not just in the review, but in the setting up of regulations yeah. and forms and procedures than I had expected. Yeah, and I'd like to be helpful if I can. You know, my colleague, Eric Carlson, I don't know if any of you have contacted him in the last 33 years, but he's been doing this job in mass for that long. And um, I'm sure he's run into this, you know, uh, I mean, there are many agricultural communities in Massachusetts. So uh, I'm gonna be talking to him tomorrow too and asking him, um, you know, if he's got any guidance for you or can give you the name of another town who's done something like what you're concerned about and then we can, you know, see what they come up with. Yeah, and when we get to the point of writing this stuff up, Margaret, I think I would want to work with the Ag Commission to make sure we cover most of the things that farmers are gonna have questions about. That sounds great. Yep. You may be a model for the rest of the state. <laughs> I'm surprised. I mean, you'd think this would have come up, you know, along the Westport River. I mean, it's true that this is, there is a lot of agriculture here relative to the rest of the state, but there certainly are other places in the state where there's Cran cranberry bugs too. Right. Oh, yeah. yes. It's probably because the nature of my job means that I know more about this than most of the people yeah. need to. Yes. And yeah. so they, they have a general sense of how you, this is supposed to work, but they're not aware of some of the legal details. Uh, like the Medway letter, I doubt very few conservation commissions have ever heard of it or even aware of it. Um, yeah, we could put it on our website if it's applicable, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's strangely written. It's written in a way where you can't easily pull excerpts out to sort of illustrate a point. You have to sort of read the whole thing to get the gist of it. Um, but it's been cited multiple times as a basis for why wetlands bylaws can't go any farther than the wetlands uh, the exemption under the Wetlands Act. Scott, are, are you of the opinion that we should go ahead with the bylaw now, or do you want it, or should we spend more time thinking about the process and, and the implementation before we take it to town meeting? Well, I think I would just want to make sure that everyone is clear how this is going to work before you finalize it and put it up for a vote. So if you write something and you never intended for the Conservation Commission to promulgate its own regulations, but we feel like we have to in order to cover these kinds of things, then we don't want that kind of a surprise to happen. Yeah. Or the other way around where we have no intention of doing all of that work and, and, and you thought, well, I thought you were gonna do the review and approvals. And, and how, how the uh, Hannah's job's gonna apply in this is still an unknown to me. You know. Are you just an administrator or are you make a decision maker? You know, are you somebody who, you know, it's the last word for people who want to proceed uh, and issue some kind of a permit to them uh, if they ask for one? Yeah, I, I, I just don't know the process yet. 
Yeah, I think that that's something that we're still exploring for sure. Um, I know that my approval is required, is required much like the conservation, uh, con excuse me, the conservation commission's approval is. Um, but I think that those details are something that need to be discussed more thoroughly. Yeah. I think we were all sort of drifting along saying, well, I, I have to admit, I thought Scott was more comfortable with this than, than he is. And, uh, and that it would, well, it'll all work out, you know, but I think we do have to spend some more time thinking. So are there other things we can accomplish here tonight or have we uh, fully aired what we can air for this one evening? I see no further questions. Mr. Betcha had his hand up. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yes, Brad, I had one more question. It's kind of a segue into where you're going. I was wondering if there was gonna be any more meetings on this? Because every time I asked a question, I think the computer gods did not want me to ask it because I lost meeting connection. So I've, I've rejoined this meeting like five times, Sarah. So um, I don't know if I missed any key parts or if there was going to be more meetings uh, after this one. See, that's what happens when you show up at so many planning board meetings. We arrange with Comcast to Sabotage oh, thanks. Yourself. You guys, you guys had me cut out. I know what you're doing. I appreciate that. <laughs> Black ball. So. You just I, I think I think we just decided that we need to regroup a bit before we come back to the town. Yeah. And there will be a public hearing. Yes, there will definitely yeah, be, a be a public hearing. Public hearing, so there'll be another opportunity to provide input and, and get more information. I was just wondering if there was like at the next meeting, if you're going to have one is to have a screen share of a portion of the map you folks keep referring to, because if it's anything like I'm very, I was very familiar with the HUD flood maps. And I don't know what these new ones look like for having any kind of control data to uh, be able to establish uh, the floodplain, because if if I understood Joy correctly, that if even a portion of the building falls within it, then the whole building's in it. Are we talking being able to reproduce this to the nearest foot, 10 feet or 100 feet? Because it's gonna put a lot of, could put, uh, potentially put a lot of people's uh, buildings or any thoughts of what they might have in a very uh, ambiguous zone because of how accurate the repeatability of putting that zone on the ground is for a project. Yeah, these are the HUD maps, uh, Mr. Becta, um, okay. because FEMA didn't take over this program until the early 1980s. So your maps are actually the HUD maps. Okay. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, uh, if it gets down to that close of a question, you know, then uh, some engineering analysis is required. But I just can't wait till you get your newer maps. It'll just make your life so much easier, you know. Yeah, it's the, the maps don't have very much in terms of references to, to try to figure out, like you don't see buildings, you don't see much detail about like plot lines or so, right. uh, but what it does have is elevations. And so in the areas where, you know, uh, there may be a question, you would look to see what is the elevation marked on the map and then, you know, a surveyor you know, theoretically could figure out where that elevation would be and you could delineate it that way. But th these are not uh, very detailed maps. So I did see one more hand get waved over in the box labeled read. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi. Just got a quick, very basic question. Uh, we would be benefited by a single point of contact as a you know property owner. If we could just go to Hannah, for example, and say, here's what we're thinking of doing. Well, who do we need to see? How many people do we have to contact to get the proper permits? So instead yeah. of having her at the end of the list, uh, maybe the number number two in the list of uh, what property owners need to, to try to do. Yeah. Or is that I just know. too common, a common sense thing to do anyway? So. Certainly, yeah, I'm more than happy to act as a point of contact. Um, 
with going through this review process, you will have to go in front of the different boards and committees. Unfortunately, I can't represent you in that process, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions or connect you to the people who can. I'll get things started. That would be very helpful. Yeah. Thank you. And are things that they were already doing, uh, are they at risk? Are they going to be grandfathered in that, um, especially in, uh, in the campground, for example, or are they subject to being disqualified or require uh, modification or not be permitted at all under new, uh, new guidelines? Or, or will they be, will they be uh, grandfathered? <laughs> Do you want me to try to answer that? Yeah. Sure, anyone who's... Yeah. So one thing I wanna note is these guidelines, as you refer to them, they're not new. Uh, they've been in place for 50 years but Massachusetts didn't adopt them all as they were supposed to. And so that's why we're having these conversations now. So they're not new. As far as things being grandfathered, um, so the reason that the NFIP has minimum regulations at all is because when a community says to FEMA, I wanna be in the NFIP so my policyholders, so that my property owners can get a flood policy if they want to, then the exchange is that FEMA says, well, okay, we'll let you in if you manage your floodplains well, and that way flood risks are reduced. And so we don't have so many claims on these policies that we're holding as insurers. So if that makes any sense. So when you say is something grandfathered, um, if I had to give you a yes or no answer, I would have to say no. However, uh, if, there are violations, that's the hard word we use for those, uh, the, then FEMA and the state work with the community to resolve the violations uh, in whatever way they can be resolved reasonably. So, um, you know, I don't know if, uh, you know, if, if your community is, um, Oh, I don't know. It's really up to your community. And then uh, if, if FEMA were to come and visit your community, they drive around the floodplains is how they do it. And the state does this sometimes too, drives around the floodplains and then reports back to the community and says, hey, look what we found. You know, at that point, then there has to be a conversation about things that are non-compliant. But it's not like we're looking for something every day in every community, because first of all, that's impossible. Uh, and there's a lot of other work that needs to be done. But the point of all this is good floodplain management and keeping people safe from flooding and property too. I don't know if that answers your question or not. That's helpful. All right. Joy, I thank you so much for coming. It's, it's been enormously helpful and Peggy as well. Um, Pleasure. We we definitely benefit from your collective wisdom. If you you know no. again you can you can give my um, my name and, and and phone number are found on the website. If you go to mass.gov and you just put in floodplain management, you'll find it. We have web pages with materials there, and Hannah has it. So if you have property owners, you know if Mr. Reed wants to um, ask some more questions, certainly. Uh, willing to help anybody, that's our job. Thank you. And thanks to everyone who came out tonight and uh, listened and provided some feedback to us. It gives us a lot to work with. Okay. Thank I think you we're all. done for tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. everybody. Good night. Okay, we're gone. Good night.